Hello and welcome to the Idaho Reports podcast. I'm Logan Finney. America's mutton consumption has increased over the past decade, and the sheep that provide that meat also provide wool and graze the rangelands of the West. However, since the U.S. joined the North American Free Trade Agreement in the 90s, domestic lamb and mutton production has declined by 60%, while imports have increased over 500% in the same time period. Idaho sheep ranchers Frank Schertz and Henry Echeverry spoke with members of the media about the issue earlier this week in the Boise foothills, calling attention to the importance of their industry and the economic threats it currently faces. Frank and I are both uh, uh, large sheep operators here in the state of Idaho, and uh, we've experienced the ups and the downs of the industry, and a big factor in the downs are the imports. That's why we're here today. And... uh, they're uh, ruining the domestic sheep industry. If we don't get a handle on this, we're done in time and not that much time because we can't hold on at these marginal prices. This year they're better, but uh, they're affected much by imports. Yeah, it's still just about break even. And uh, as soon as they get it up a little bit, then they'll bring more imports. It's what, 73 to 77% right now is foreign lamb. And they just take more and more. and these range outfits, they're gone, they're gone. And they're not gonna come back. And him and I, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's not just us, heck, we can walk away. But we do love this industry. And we'd like to, and then they do these, this country a lot of good. This is my range right here. And I don't even get the sheep down in there anymore. I used to have sheep right there on that hill, but uh, so many people and dogs and everything, I just, we keep them up higher and then we climb out of here pretty fast. But this this is a big, big deal out here. Someday a fire will start in here and all them trails and people scattered up to here. And it's the same way all over the Western United States. They need those sheep. Well, right here, this was once Brad Little, our governor's grandfather, who was the sheep king, Andy Little, right here, Emmett, back at Emmett, he had 100,000 head. And prior to him, there were other, they, they, there was an influx of Scotch, Scottish people that came and then after that they employed Basque sheep herders and the Basque sheep herders uh, figured out they could branch off and do their own thing and that's kind of how I, I'm in this deal. My dad came here in 1929 from the uh, Basque country and- uh, I'll bet you 70% of the sheepmen, West Range sheepmen in America are uh, descendants of sheep herders that come in here, wouldn't you say? Andrew? Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. That were sheep herders well, come in here on come in the west and, and in Idaho yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Back when the bad time, you know, back in the World Wars, wool was high, and because they're feeding the soldiers, and like some people say, if we, we might be speaking German, wasn't with American sheep man back then. And then they had all these extra sheep, and you know, the sheep man, the sheep are going to price went to the bottom. A lot of those sheep herders, you know, a sheep herder, he saves his money because he's got everything, and they bought sheep they go back then there the taylor grazing went in and they get some range and they went and bought a sheep and there and they was in business 75 percent is 74 percent for one percent is uh imported lamb into this country of which 75 percent of that is australian and it's duty free they come in here with no tariff any restrictions whatsoever well the american dollar when that's 65 cents to our dollar I mean, they bring it in here and they sell it that much cheaper and we can't compete with it. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I like to think I'm a heck of a good sheep man and I know this guy right here is a heck of a good sheep man. But, and we get, we get production per you uh, as good as I think you can do, but we can't, we can't do it. And it's a, and there's nobody, you know, I, I got one nephew, he'd love to have this outfit and I, I'd let him have it, but I don't want to put him to it. There's so much and all the other stuff we go through and everything else and we need to be paid for it and those and those imports coming in here that's just it's just not right domestic there's uh uh between 1500 and 2700 tons of lamb brought in a week into the united states not a month not a year a week that's a lot they got it. We've, we've both been back and we've been to DC and we sat there and everybody, boy, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Then we can, we'll help you in. That's the last you hear about it. They don't want to, they don't want to be in with Australia and New Zealand. 
You know, what was in the yesterday they talked on the they just sold them so many missiles and all that big deal as little sheep herders but they're sacrificing what i want to know why has another country got the right to come in here and ruin an industry because they're going to ruin this industry i mean they've already about ruined it but they're going to ruin it we need to take care of our own we understand what the situation is we don't produce enough to meet the needs of the country however we we need to be able to sustain our operations with a superior, a better product. And that's, that's all. Uh, I think the nation owes it to us, protection. I mean, you know, I don't expect them to be there with naval ships, sinking barges, bringing lamb over here. However, uh, I think they need to protect their domestic producers. We're the guys that pay the taxes and property taxes, uh, and taxes on our income and, and whatnot, you know. And uh, those guys, like I said, they come in here duty free. But that's the way we do it. Over the years, in the last 30 years, I think I probably bought out, one time we knew how many, close to 40 sheep outfits. And I bought them, you know, when sheep were cheap, you know, everybody would go sell them Frank, you know, I'd keep <laughs> on them going. And, uh, and I bought them when they was real cheap. But I, I think it's close to 40 outfits that I bought them clear out, and they're gone. I got the ranges of the Highland and the Stringer outfits, and uh, but uh, the rest of it, it's gone. And if it had been 20 years ago, I'd have probably been buying, last year when they got so cheap, I'd have been buying lambs, a bit ewe lambs, and going. But uh, I was so mad all last year that I didn't do it. We were scared last year. We really yeah. were been in this a long time, and it looked pretty, pretty grim. That's why we kind of started this effort. Frank and I conversing, uh, how much longer can we stand this? And we thought, by damn, we better do something about this. So uh, we got the ball, we so to speak, got the ball rolling on this import issue. That's how this got started. These sheep mean a lot to my family. I mean, it's not as old as my dad. And I had sheep, I bought my first sheep when I was a little boy. And all that. I don't have, I never got married, never had kids. Should have, but I didn't. And, uh, I was married to this sheep outfit. And I worked, I mean, uh, till the last four or five years as an operation and stuff, you know, I worked harder than any man I had. And I, and, uh, and I just went and never say, you know, I saved my money and put it all back in this outfit. And just kept, and Brad, I had a stringer outfit over there in Oregon, I'd got it. And then Brad Little, he'd come over and buy bucks from me. And he said, I'm gonna sell you that outfit. So no, you're not. And the uh, sheep price was terrible, and and he shot me a deal, and I got gone. I I bought the outfit, and I called up my dad. I didn't want to even tell my dad. I said, Dad, you know Brad shot me a good deal on that outfit. Well, yeah, yeah. And, I, and then I finally said, and I bought it. And he says, well, that sounds like a good enough deal, but what the hell would you want it for? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I it mean, like, you know, it's in our blood. You know, every time we drive by, a, whether you got one sheep in the field or 10, we all think we always take a look, I know. Yeah. And with me, I've got, I don't have any sons. My daughters are here. I have two daughters that live in this area, one right here in North Boise and the other, my other daughter in Star. I have grandkids, but this is, uh, uh, they've got their lives and uh, it's uh, quite a transition if they were to, they were raised around it, but, and my one daughter helps me, Dominique helps me a, a lot on my shippings and that. However, uh, it's a, I have to say, it's a hell of a nice outfit in Eastern Idaho. It's all put together. It took a lot of years to do it. And I would hope that it would be profitable enough for someone to want to, undertake it or take part of it and another somebody else take another part of it but uh if we don't get this import deal straightened out and get this price where it's stable it might be adios i think you know growing up in this you hear about the ups and the downs um but i see the the true seriousness of this um i have great respect yeah here i do get emotional <laughs> uh for the sheep industry and these two men and um, and they're they're so sincere in this effort, um, and I think that if they're saying it's dire, 
it's real, you know, because being in agriculture, it is like you have to be the hardiest person ever because you're you're dealing with Mother Nature and the government. And it's really um, you're dealing with so many factors. So you have to be so resilient and optimistic. And I've seen that, um, especially growing up <laughs> with my dad. But to know that this is, you know, th th this is real um, and hopefully I, you know, it goes beyond the local level. I hope at the national level, there's recognition of, um, yeah, let's, let's balance this out. And we don't want to kill the Australian, New Zealand no, sheep, man. No, no. And, and, I, and I think maybe it would help it, really. I think maybe it would help. And it is interesting. Like, I remember when I was part of some different um, organizations within the sheep industry. I mean, there are conversations and overall... You want to spread the idea of eat lamb, um, but it does. I think it's just, you know, they would want it to be fair on their end if it were a reverse situation. So it seems very reasonable, um, but it's about livelihoods. When you look back at the Wood Hills, what do you think of in terms of working with sheep? For me, it's funny. I've been trained well, because when I look at any foothills, I often think about the sheep feed, <laughs> and I learned that from him. Um, but yeah, I would say... Certainly, I look at it as um, just how beautiful it is and how lucky we are um, as feed, but also as fuel. And it can be good fuel or it can be dangerous fuel. And it is a true story. Sheep truly serve a benefit of, um, you know, helping um, manage that. And um, I was actually telling Frank a story that I was mountain biking up here a couple of years ago. I'm a, you know, it's cheesy, but I see his herd of sheep and I'm just in heaven because it's a beautiful sight moving through and the herder and, and it's, um, it's a, it's a really pure, you know, it's, it's a pure way of making a livelihood. We've contacted the, uh, um, uh, trade commission, uh, ambassador, uh, we've, uh, notified or, uh, uh, contacted our, uh, Congressional delegation. I spoke with the governor myself, as did Frank, last week. Uh, he was very receptive, and he's at, I don't know if he's there now, at the Western Governor's Conference. I don't think it's starting until next week. Anyway, he's yeah. going there, and he said he would talk in, uh, with other governors from the West, and we spoke with other sheep operators from other states, and uh, they are also aware of this, their governors, to for them to contact their governors and to carry the message and to try to get something like that political because that's what it's about but the thing is you know the guys that call the shots they're not too sympathetic to us because we're, we're we're a small industry but when we're gone we're gone and people will miss us because we provide a lot of services you might say we use the services we buy uh, a lot of uh, supplies fuel we use the truckers uh, we buy the hay from the farmers the grain pastures we're looking at yeah the, the pasture we pasture these alfalfa fields off in the fall you know, there might be that much growth, there might be that much growth. They spread that fertilizer all over the field and the rodents in there. And these farmers, they love to have those sheep in there. These out, you know, guys. That's right. And uh, one guy, he, he don't ever spray, he's got three, 400 acres out ever, never has to spray them because those sheep every fall come in there. And they, people say, did you get bugs? Did you get the bugs? And they're all the weevil. And, nah, I got sheep. But uh, no, they're very, they're, they got, the sheep's got so many useful. I don't think we even touched the bottom of what they can be used for. But and they're wonderful meat, and but it's terrible when these lambs sitting right here and can't get them dead, but they ship them clear around the world. A product that won't even start. They're to not touch fresh it. from imported lamb. Is they claim it's fresh, but it's been slaughtered a month, thirty days sooner. But they, the the meat packing industry is uh, sophisticated enough to where they can vacuum pack these and they chill them at a certain temperature and they bring them here just barely. They may even not even freeze them, but they'll have them like 32 and a half degrees or something. So they just barely under being frozen. We could, if we could just get along like a, uh, a trade-off, because like Frank says, there aren't enough domestic lambs in this country to uh, supply the, the demand. However, we, they, they, the way they infiltrate our, our, our niche, our, our prices, they come in and they'll chase it down. They'll go offer, well, they, they play the game, the purveyors, like I mentioned earlier. They'll say, uh, 
uh, or we can get it for this much less, uh, I think we'll quit you guys. So what do they do? They got, they got to keep that blood on the floor, so to speak. That's something kind of crude, but that's the name of the game in a packing business. And the smaller our industry gets, the worse it is. The infrastructure just keeps going away, and it's harder to fill that that uh, niche there that we need to do. And Solution is going to be, I think, some form of a, uh, whether it be a quota or if we, uh, which I don't think we could ever have this, but it would be great. They did at one time have an agreement with Australia, New Zealand, and the United States not to inundate our market. But that's basically, they're not honoring that, and I don't think it's affected anymore. And get cheaper overseas with the cheaper. dollar. The dollar. Lime is becoming uh, more popular uh, as we go along. They're under, they're realizing that it's a really excellent meat, and uh, but uh, whenever whenever we get it rolling, you might say for us, here they come. They're smart. They're good marketers. And my hell almighty, uh, for a dollar U.S., it's a buck seventy in exchange, roughly buck fifty to a buck seventy. It varies with the exchange rate. But it's, it's like going to Vegas and winning every hand. And they don't have restrictions like we have in this country. We have to, uh, more regulations with our help. We use sheep herders, the H2A program, which has been wonderful, wonderful for us, wonderful for the, the men that we use. It provides them uh, a good income and uh, they better their families in Peru or Mexico or wherever. But uh, uh, it's... Uh, they in Australia they don't uh, they don't have the predation predators like we do here right here Frank had sheep piled up right up here with wolves right there on that point above the capital last year killed 142 head I believe it was and and they they can use a toxicant uh, it's called 1080 they, it was here in the United States until about 1973 and then it was taken out with because of the overlap of its uh, it would kill several you know different species and that certainly isn't popular with the public. And uh, we had that control, but in Australia, they don't. So they, they've got advantages. They don't need to labor like we have, but our lambs are, truthfully, they're superior in taste and quality because they're raised on these wonderful ranges in the West. And then ours are further processed just a bit in a feedlot until they reach a certain specific weight. And then, and then they're, uh, slaughtered from there and that's what hurt us here last year because they couldn't get him killed and uh, consequently they got heavier and heavier and heavier and they become more uh, fatty less desirable for the consumer like a year ago we'd had a good market the year before and uh, in november they begging for heavy lambs and they didn't have any and and they, the kill was cut down, and then they got some during the year, and they said, oh, we got too many. And, boy, we couldn't even, we couldn't even sell those, these good Idaho mountain lambs. In uh, August, when they went to market, we sent them to the feedlots in Colorado and just feeding the feed costs are, you know, how they have been the last couple of years. It was terrible. And I, my lambs, just about, we just well about gave them away up here. I mean, that's just the way it we might maybe have been better off. And doggone, you sit right down here, you go into Albertsons, I can't sell my lambs. You go into Costco, in Winko now, they were carrying American lamb. And it's not all their fault because it, we're getting to be a smaller industry too. And, and uh, but it needs to be a quota or something. But yeah, right there stores, you see it. And my lambs right up here can't even sell them the best lambs in the world. They're second best or full. Well, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're very good lambs. At uh, at uh, last year, to buck thirty five, buck forty lambs, uh, some were getting less than that. Uh, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. We've got to get probably a minimum of a, like a buck eighty, dollar eighty a pound. To yeah, that's at uh, minimum. That's probably minimum. Yeah, and uh, but last year, like yeah, mo most of my lambs come out of the feedlot, and I we got twelve. I got a twelve dollar freight bill getting them there, and they was bringing about a dollar twenty. You know, and could, then we got them up there and couldn't get them dead. And we had to put them on a hay, feed them hay for a while. And to slow start, their growth. So they wouldn't gain, growth. but hay cost just as much and they didn't gain on it. I mean, and there was no call for that. They kept this lamb meat price high in the store and the, and then they brought imports in to fill in a little bit until we got that little bit over, 
supply and bang. So you're well under the cost of production right now. Not now, no. Right we're now we're, we're, just, we're, we're yeah. above it a little. We're above yeah. it. Okay. No, but last year it was under. It was a bad year. And Three plus all of our years. costs were so high. Our hay, the corn, the truck and the fuel, everything. All of our expense, the groceries for our herders, uh, everything. The wages, uh, you know, uh, everything was elevated. And our returns, our revenues were down. And uh, they were like Frank said, they were, then they start feeding them a hay ration, which is just a maintenance to keep them from gaining. And that, that does hurt the quality of the product and it hurts our bottom line because it's extremely expensive and we're having them custom fed. And don't get us wrong, I mean, they need the foreign lamb in here now to, because of the supply, but it needs to be, uh, we got both got a good friend. He went over there years ago and he said, you guys don't need to do this to us. There's room for us all here. And they said, oh, we just care about that market share. And they get it all, then you look out. But these range outfits, when they're gone, and you look down in California, you look down there, that fire's burning up down there. And a lot of it's because they won't harvest that timber. But they've, they've run those sheep men out. They've made it so tough on those sheep men. I mean, that's a lot of the cause of running those. There should be a lot of sheep in California. And they're just getting less and less. There's not going to be any down there pretty quick, very few, the way they're going. It's not going to change within a year, but I think they could get some legislation or something to, to not necessarily legislation, but some kind of regulation to uh, offset the influx of so many imports, so many tons of lamb. That would really help. That would bolster the market. It, it'd show those guys in, that are moving the lamb back east. It's mainly back east, back in... Uh, New Jersey and Philadelphia area and New York City in that east that's where the big consumption is uh, it would show those guys that uh, they just can't hold that over our heads like oh gosh we'll go to those imports well maybe those imports aren't quite as available and they've got to respect us we're not wanting to uh, screw them over we just need to have yeah, what is fair yeah. they're just they can they can dump it in there they can produce it cheaper than we can the packers are doing the best they can, but see, they got to sell that meat to the next guy. They got to sell it to the purveyor, the guy that is the jobber, the guy that knocks on the door of the, the restaurant or the grocery stores and uh, the big chains, Becky, so the, the Kroger's and the, uh, you know, the, the Wal Walmarts and that. The sheep industry through the organization RCAF has presented a petition to U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai detailing the challenges they face. The petition requests that tariffs and rate quotas be placed on imported Australian and New Zealand lamb to preserve the economic viability of the domestic sheep industry. Thanks so much for listening to the Idaho Reports podcast. We'll be back next week with another new episode. And in the meantime, you can find all of our reporting online at idahoreports.org. Presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin, the producer and host of Dialogue. For more than 25 years, we've been bringing you conversations that matter. More than 150 of those conversations are with writers, and now you can take them with you wherever you go, while you're walking, around the house, or in the car. Just search for Dialogue with Marsha Franklin on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms, and remember to subscribe so that new shows download automatically. Enjoy.